just want to welcome everyone back to the, the second part of the presentation. So this is part two of the six part webinar series and it's divided into our two speakers. Um, the separate presentation from Andre and this presentation is prof from Professor Ken Herman um, from Essen University Hospital in Germany. And um, we're really delighted to um, have his insights um, into the synergistic uh, PET MRI imaging in clinical practice, um, looking at some of the current advantages and future directions. Uh, once again, uh, I need to thank um, Siemens for, for joining Reigns um, and sponsoring this event. We can't do these sorts of things without um, the support of our sponsors. So to be able to provide these kinds of CPD opportunities um, for free um, to all of our um, members and, and nuclear medicine community beyond uh, our membership, um, we need to thank Siemens um, for their ongoing support. So without uh, further delay, I'll uh, hand over to uh, Ken and I uh, hope you enjoy his presentation. Good evening, everybody. It's my distinct pleasure uh, to talk to you. Uh, it's, it's a little bit strange in our days in Corona times because I would have loved to be in Australia uh, physically, but uh, we will do the best. And uh, I hope we am going to present you a couple of 20, 25 minutes uh, about PET-MR and how we do it in daily clinical practice. Uh, my name is Ken Hermann. I'm currently based in Essen. Um, most of you might not be familiar with Essen. That's why a short introduction. It's actually not such a small city in Germany. We have uh, around 600,000 inhabitants. Uh, this was the first German cancer center set up uh, in the 1960s and the capture area uh, is 5 million. Uh, 5 million, in, of, of, which is quite significant if you uh, keep in mind that whole Germany has only 80 million of people. Essen has a long-standing history on hybrid imaging. Indeed, uh, there was the first European Siemens PET CT installed in 2001. Uh, we had one of the first five uh, whole body PET MRs, and I will talk a little bit more in detail about this later, uh, which was installed in 2011. And we are currently doing more than 7,000 uh, PET scans, including uh, PET CT and PET MR per year. This is a short uh, uh, view through our a hybrid imaging department, uh, so-called. We have uh, currently two uh, PET CT scanners. A third one is going to be installed in Q1 uh, 21. We have one uh, PET MR and we are running two uh, SPEC CT cameras. The talk will be separate into three parts. First, I want to give you a little bit of uh, information about PET MR, the, the history of uh, PET MR both in general, but also uh, later on a little bit more in detail about uh, the history in Essen. Then I want to discuss with you the so-called Essen experience, uh, our lessons learned, and, and then the third part, which is I think is always the most interesting part because it's uh, a daring, a little outlook into the future. Indeed, I was still in Munich in, in 2010 when the first whole body PET MR was installed. Uh, and you can see here on the right side, uh, my, my former mentor and currently actually the CEO of the hospital in Munich, Markus Schweiger, as well as the back then uh, 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 prime minister of the province of Bavaria, uh, introducing here the first uh, whole body uh, Siemens uh, PET-MR in November 2010. And uh, uh, we performed five years later a survey, and I will present a little bit more data about it later on, but in, in, in 2015 already more than 110 systems were installed and I can tell you now that another five years later we have around 160 of these dedicated PET-MR systems set up in the world. In the previously mentioned survey in 2015 we tried to, to get a snapshot on how PET-MR is uh, actually used and I think the interesting part is when you look at the at the pie chart up here, you can see that around 50% um, around of the cases, this was a research uh, uh, indication, and in 50% of the cases, the PET-MR was already used for clinical purposes. If you look at the uh, breakdown on what are the indications, it's uh, actually both the case for research as well as for, uh, uh, for clinical use that oncology is dominating. 88% uh, was the oncology chair for the clinical studies and, and 76% uh, in the research studies. We also asked uh, during the survey, what do we think will be the key applications uh, in three, four years from when we uh, conducted the survey? And, and, and very interesting, 
uh, when, when you see here, this is still showing you the present key applications, and this changes very quickly here to the key applications in three years from now, and you can see that all of a sudden cardiovascular appeared before, not even mentioned, and now already uh, seven of the surveyors said that uh, we believe that uh, uh, cardiovascular is actually the, the field to grow. Another field which was supposed to uh, grow significantly is actually the, the field of inflammation. And, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, a lot of them said that oncology is going to stay. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the ESN experience. And here, this is uh, images of the bringing in the first uh, uh, PET MR in, in, in Essen. And you can see that it was actually quite uh, exciting, not only for us, but also for the construction people, because they really had to, to break down a wall. And luckily, uh, back then, we had uh, not a rainy summer. So this was uh, actually done uh, uh, yeah, quite, uh, quite, quite easily. The interesting part of how we run PET MR is that this is really a truly interdisciplinary cooperation. This is run jointly by radiology, nuclear medicine, and obviously for PETMA also medical physics plays a very important role. We have up to now performed more than 7,500 examinations. And as I said before, Essen is a cancer center, so the main indication in Essen is obviously also oncology. This is now the breakthrough uh, of the number of scans. And, and the first uh, full year of scanning was in 2012. So we, we started slowly with uh, 580 scans, and you can see that it's actually uh, increased over the time. And, and, and we are now constantly at uh, 1,000 to 1,200 scans per year, and these are also the numbers from 2019, uh, pretty much in that ballpark. Looking at what kind of PET-MRs we perform in Essen, we can see that the majority of them are actually whole body PET-MRs. You can see here 37%. Uh, we have partially also dedicated uh, uh, parts of the body where we look at. For example, the abdomen plays a big role. Uh, we have a strong uh, thyroid background in essence, so obviously head and neck is a very important uh, part. But we also have dedicated brain, cardiac, breast, and lung scans. However, the dominating one, and I still think that this is the beauty of, uh, of PET in general, but especially PET MR as well, is obviously the whole body scans. In the next minutes, I want to discuss a little bit, uh, I think, the four uh, main pillars of PET-MR imaging, uh, including oncological imaging. We will discuss a little bit of cardiovascular, neuroradiology, and also inflammatory disease applications of the PET-MR. And, and I will also highlight where I personally believe that uh, we really uh, have now already implemented the PET-MR in our daily clinical routine. I want to kick off uh, with oncological imaging, and uh, I, I guess uh, everywhere in the world right now for nuclear medicine, one of the key applications is prostate imaging. Uh, I'm a nuclear medicine physician, so please excuse if my MR knowledge is uh, rather mediocre. But uh, uh, as you can see here in this prostate MR, uh, in, in the corresponding transaxial slice of the T2 uh, sequence, uh, it's it's quite difficult actually to to securely identify a potential primary prostate cancer. Uh, when you look at the corresponding uh, ADC maps, obviously now indicated by the errors, uh, there is indeed uh, a hypo intense uh, intensity. But when you look at the corresponding PSMA signal here down here, uh, and this is now fused with the uh, with the with the PET with the MR. You can really see in the fused PET MR a beautiful increased PSMA uptake in the area of uh, ADC abnormality. And this, in case, was later on also confirmed by histopathology to be a primary prostate cancer. In, in general, the beauty of, of PET MR is obviously bringing the strengths of MR, which is mainly the morphological resolution uh, and the metabolism indicated by, by PET together. Another example where MR is already very strong in the detection, outperforming uh, in many cases CT, is, uh, uh, is uh, soft tissue sarcoma. This is now an example of a patient. We have one of the largest uh, sarcoma sites here in, in Germany. So accordingly, we, we do quite uh, see a lot of these patients. And always, already very obvious in the corresponding MR, you can see here in the different sequences, 
in both trans exhibit also uh, coronal uh, very nicely the primary tumor. And uh, this is very much in line when you look at the corresponding uh, FDG signal in the fused PET-MR. Uh, it's very clear that the PET information is not needed for the primary uh, identification of the tumor, but what you and also see nicely here is indeed that these tumors are very heterogeneous and the FDC signal gives us a little bit of information how the, uh, the, the tumor cells are distributed within the tumor, number one. And number two, uh, we also have a very good tool to perform treatment response assessment. And a very nice thing we do have in the, in the, in the combined PET-MR is that we can also perform whole body uh, assessment. And in this case, this poor patient indeed also had significant uh, uh, metastinal lymph nodes, uh, which you can see here, and which are very easy detected in a quick whole body PET-MR. As mentioned before, we have a strong uh, sarcoma group here. So we do also have some uh, dedicated therapies, for example, the so-called isolated lymph perfusion uh, treatment, which means that uh, chemotherapy is really dedicated, given to a certain part uh, of the body where the tumor is, in this case, really the, the extremity. And, and this is now a, a, a pre-therapy uh, uh, MR. And, and again, the tumor mass is very nicely seen and identified on the MR. Uh, what happens when these patients undergo treatment is that the tumor very often, especially in sarcomas, doesn't really change in size. And now the big question is, did the patient benefit from the therapy or not? And this is uh, from a size criteria, and this is typical for sarcoma, we very often see stable disease. So the tumor doesn't really change, and the big question remains, did we impact the viability of the tumor, yes or no? And this is now the sweet spot of the combination of, of, of PET and morphological imaging, and you can see here the corresponding uh, FDG PET uh, before and after uh, uh, isolated uh, lymph perfusion, and you can really see from the PET that uh, even though the mass hasn't changed in size, it's completely aviral. And, and uh, this that's why I also uh, believe that this is one of the indications where we do not hesitate anymore, we, we, we actually use PET-MR uh, routinely, is uh, in these kind of patients where you can nicely see here that uh, the combination of information is really helping guiding us, the patient management. Overall, and I think this is uh, the sweet spot of, of, of PET in general, still heavily underutilized is to perform response assessment. And I want to quickly only uh, highlight here one of the most cited papers, if not the most cited papers in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine of Richard Wall, introducing uh, PET response criteria in solid tumors. Another big driver of nuclear medicine is uh, the, uh, the introduction of, of, of new PET traces. And most of you are familiar with neonicrine tumors and the dedicated uh, somatostatin 2 receptor expression. And indeed, as many of these uh, patients already also present liver metastasis, we all know that liver is obviously uh, the, the sweet spot of MR imaging. And that's why uh, we also moved into uh, using combined uh, PET-MR for the uh, primary staging of neonicrine tumor patients with suspected or confirmed uh, liver manifestations. And this uh, example shows you very nicely again that the combination of both MR and in this case, the top PET MR is providing the maximum of information. And especially as PET is very sensitive, it can provide very important information in the part of the body where MR is anatomically uh, potentially a little bit inferior to CT. And, and, and this is also why we in, in, in patients, in, in, in GAPNET patients, use nowadays uh, PET-MR uh, with Dolatoc routinely for primary staging, but also for follow-up. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the most important application, I think, for PET is still uh, assessing a treatment response. This becomes even more obvious uh, in neonicrine tumors because here we not only have uh, somatostatin receptor directed imaging, but also somatostatin directed uh, therapy available, so called PRT. And this is an example of a patient uh, where we first of all confirmed prior to therapy the somatostatin 2 receptor expression. And, and this is one of the uh, subgroup of patients which are well differentiated. They have a, 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 a CHI 67 of, of less than 20%. So these are the G1 and G2 tumors, and they are qualifying for also a dedicated. Uh, uh, PRT treatment with autism talk. And uh, I show you the same patient before and after therapy, and we can see that in this very advanced 
non-curative setting, uh, we did not only stabilize the tumor growth, but we were also able to actually uh, uh, receive a certain kind of response in these patients. And the recently published NETA uh, one trial has shown that patients uh, significantly benefit uh, regarding progression-free survival from this treatment. And it becomes very obvious that again, the combination of the metabolic and the morphological information is here absolutely helpful to manage and assess the patients. Now I want to shift gears and I want to move into uh, the cardiovascular space. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of examples. One example, one example is uh, the imaging of acute myocardial infarction. And this again is a, a, a part where we actually can benefit from the strengths of both MR and, uh, and PET information. Uh, obviously, MR with late enhancement is a very sensitive tool in the assessment of uh, myocardial infarction, and this can be nicely seen here on, on, the, on, the, on the image here. You can very nicely see here the uh, increased uh, late enhancement. And in very much in alignment here, the corresponding PET information in the area of the scar tissue, we see a hypermetabolism uh, of, of FDG, and you can see here that this information in this case is very much in line and even helps us, uh, provides partially even complementary information when we look at the, uh, the wall movement or at the certain uh, sites of the infarction. Another uh, example where we do use uh, PET-MR uh, in, in cardiac indications is the diagnosis of acute myocarditis. Uh, it's, it's not always easy to, to be 100% sure about uh, the assessment of, uh, of, of, of both uh, the effection of a tissue and pericardial effusion, even so that obviously MR is here, the, uh, the, the first imaging tool, and we can nicely show in the combination of FEG in the, uh, in, in the kind of uh, not, not so clear uptake in the corresponding uh, uh, late enhancement is very much in line. And again, this is one of the patients when the MR on its own is not conclusive, we do perform FDG PET-MR to uh, assess the impact of the myocarditis on the cardiac tissue. One of the big uh, uh, renovations uh, of the last years in, in, in the use of, of uh, uh, cardiac PET actually is the so-called body compass. This is a software recently introduced by Siemens and I want to show you uh, why we like it so much. You see on the far left, the gated image, you see in the, in the middle, the uncorrected images. We also know that gated images uh, not only take a little more time, but even here, when you compare this to the body compass, you can see that the body compass provides the crispest and nicest images. And, uh, and this is also how actually uh, Siemens is now kind of trying to, uh, to convince the customers to, to, uh, to, to use it. It's not only improving the image sharpness, but it's also uh, improving the efficiency because in contrast to the gated studies, now of the data is rejected and advantage is compared to the gated studies, it's reducing also acquisition time. And as we know, one of the biggest limitations of PET-MR is indeed that the uh, acquisition times are comparably higher than for PET-CT. And that's why this, I think, is a very important and very helpful tool, uh, which we also are very happy to use. Now I want to switch to neuroradiology. Uh, I want to here quickly highlight uh, again an oncological application, the diagnosis of glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, obviously, we do not uh, use uh, PET uh, as a standard for primary staging, but it's very useful for follow-up imaging, especially in, in cases where uh, we see contrast enhancement. We don't, we're not sure if this is a pseudo progression or real progression. And this is a typical example of a patient who had uh, glioblastoma primary resection, and we can see here uh, the uptake. The, the contrast enhancement and the corresponding NMR, also indicated by the error. And, and we look at the corresponding uh, PET information, it becomes very obvious that indeed this contrast enhancement also shows an increased amino acid um, uh, metabolism. And the combined information makes it very clear that in this case, the patient is unfortunately experiencing progression and not only pseudo progression. And uh, here's an, again an example. In this case, it's not uh, uh, FET, but it's methionine, which is, is, a, is a very similar amino acid labeled with uh, C11. And this actually shows us 
uh, two patients where uh, we see an increased uh, uh, contrast uh, media uptake in the in the MR, whereas on, on the upper patient, the SVMAX with the 3.6 actually indicates in this case the, the high likelihood of being real progression, whereas the lower patient is an example of the, the patient who really uh, shows up uh, increased contrast uptake in the MR, but no increased amino acid uptake. In this case, the patient really experienced luckily on pseudo progression and uh, didn't have to undergo new treatment. Now we are moving to one of the areas which I believe is going to experience a lot of growth in general in the future for nuclear medicine, but also especially uh, for PET-MR and the imaging of inflammatory diseases. Uh, I want to kick off as an example, a patient who has uh, suspected spondylitis uh, in the MR, we know that there's a high rate of false positive findings and, and, and the error very nice indicated the area of interest. And, and this patient underwent an additional uh, uh, FTG pet, and, and here you can very nicely see that indeed there is no increased FTG metabolism. In this case, the patient was confirmed uh, to have only post fracture changes and no inflammatory changes in this area. And another example, uh, 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 PET also has a higher detection rate, PET MR, uh, compared to MR alone. And this is now a very similar situation. Patient has symptoms, patient shows. This presents uh, these images on the corresponding MR. Uh, when we look at the corresponding FTG information, increased, uh, increased FTG metabolism, it becomes quite obvious that this patient is indeed uh, suffering from active spondylitis. And in this study published in 2016, indeed, uh, PET MR had a higher sensitivity, 100% compared to 50% than MR, but also a higher specificity. And I think this is quite uh, appealing. Another uh, uh, indication we do actually use uh, uh, PET-MR here quite, uh, quite frequently is in patients with severe Crohn's disease and uh, where the irregular imaging findings are not 100% uh, uh, in, in increment uh, with, with, with the clinical findings. And this is one of the examples. A patient uh, with Crohn's disease uh, presents this uh, uh, thickened uh, wall on the corresponding MR and increased uh, uh, contrast uptake. And, and uh, this is a corresponding uh, uh, a coronal image of this patient. And when we look at the, at the FTG, we really see that indeed there is increased uh, FTG uptake and this confirms active inflammation of the ascending colon. Interestingly, uh, we do use uh, FTG PET-MR in Crohn's disease not only for diagnosis, but also for assessing response to treatment of these new uh, treatment modalities. We have performed uh, uh, early on uh, a, a summary of the first 2,300 uh, patients undergoing uh, PET-MR and being published on PET-MR. And uh, I, I want to quickly highlight what we, uh, uh, what we summarized back then. So we actually found out in these first 2,300 patients that FTG PET-MR and PET-CT provided very comparable diagnostic information. Uh, we believe, and I still believe, that in case that uh, PET-MR becomes economically viable and, and we have uh, improved workflows, which I think we are on, on the way to do this, that indeed in PET-MR can actually take over a significant part of the PET-CT business, especially in cases where uh, MR is by definition superior to CT. And uh, what we haven't really used uh, in the clinical routine yet is uh, optimizing the multiparametric potential. And in, in the later part, I will discuss where I think this could be really of high value. And I want to quickly highlight that we have recently published from the ESN experience uh, more than uh, combined thousand subsequent examinations. And in this, we really have to say that uh, PET-MR, in summary, is at least as good as PET-CT for the whole body stage regarding a cursor. Now, in the last part, I want to quickly discuss a couple of uh, uh, future developments. First of all, a big driver uh, in nuclear medicine, but also for PET-MR, is, uh, uh, is the introduction of new tracers. I've quickly uh, discussed already about the amino acids and the, and the somatostatin uh, 2 receptor uh, tracers. Uh, however, we all know that PSMA, 
uh, for prostate cancer is going to play a very important role. We have dedicated uh, tracers uh, visualizing the CXCR4 expression. Uh, DOPA, I think, is going to play a more important role if it's widely available. And the interesting part is we have every year more and more new tracers being implemented with FAP on the FAP pipette being one of the most recent uh, innovators in the field. Another advantage of PET-MR and, and uh, partially so far only capitalized is the, the reduced radiation compared to PET-CT is something which I think believes, uh, I believe plays an important role, especially in children, not so much in, in elderly above 80, but in, in children, I think it, it, it's really important. And here's an example uh, where we actually also do use quite frequently now uh, PET-MR is really in children. And we have very similar performance in our own data, uh, actually even slightly better for PET-MR compared to PET-CT, but overall very similar. But if you look at the corresponding radiation dose, obviously the, the, the CT radiation dose is replaced by no radiation by an MR. And this can really cut it down to 25% of the combined radiation. And uh, uh, as now the, the 4.7 millisieverts are mainly driven by, uh, by the PET, I really hope that the introduction of digital PET and, and, and uh, Siemens, but also GE have now already uh, started to implement digital PET also in the combined PET MR scanners. Yeah, you can really see that uh, we might be even able to, to reduce the combined radiation to uh, less than two millisieverts. I, managed, uh, I mentioned before that one of the biggest challenge of uh, PET MR compared to PET CT is that indeed the MR protocols uh, are usually taking longer than the PETC protocols. So we did quite some work here to uh, implement so-called fast protocols to, to increase the throughput. And, uh, and then I want to quickly show you only, uh, and this has been published, that uh, we are now at the, at the stage where we can really perform whole body fast PET MR with only three MR sequences within 26 minutes. The performance is very similar regarding tumor detection to PET-CT. And when you look at the difference between 18 minutes, which is uh, the, the typical time of a scan uh, with six to seven bit positions on the PET-CT and 26 minutes for, for the fast PET-MR, we are really getting close. Not equal yet, but uh, again, we are still working on that. And uh, I think one of the really exciting things, as mentioned before, is really uh, the so-called uh, body compass, where they really improve the delineation of small lesions. And I become, I think, better than words are always images. When you look at this example, it's really the same patient. And on the left side, the gated images, which take longer because, again, we reject a lot of information. On the right side, the corresponding uh, uh, images derive with the body compass. It becomes absolutely obvious that, uh, that this is really a significant improvement in performance. And here it becomes even more obvious if you really do the snapshot and, and compare side by side uh, uh, the, 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 the gated images compared with the body compass image. And I mentioned also quickly that I think one of the fields which we haven't taken advantage enough of yet is the multiparametric imaging with MR, but also in the future with dynamic uh, PET, we are able to provide a lot of different sequences, a lot of different uh, complex data sets. And uh, I think this is something which we really have to capitalize in the future. Uh, and, and this is also what I want to highlight in this slide very quickly is that uh, with these combined uh, PET MR scanners, we are able to, to generate a huge amount of data. And, and, and once we find tools, and we are currently trying to do this either with radiomics, but also in combination uh, with uh, uh, lab parameters, if we are able to really yeah. kind of uh, uh, find ways to derive the information which is not uh, immediately seen by the eye, I think then we can really try to really do a lot of uh, histopathology just by imaging. And uh, another last example now is uh, the checkpoint imaging. Uh, we all know that these uh, therapies uh, are absolutely amazing. However, uh, we still don't know how to really uh, assess response in these patients. And I want to quickly show you uh, a patient with uh, uh, melanoma. And uh, this is a patient that went to MR before therapy, uh, after two weeks of therapy. And you can see here that, again, from a size criteria, nothing really has changed. Uh, after 12 weeks of immunotherapy, uh, we can see indeed that there is partial remission also according to size criteria. 
Uh, in contrast, if you look at the FDG pad, you can already see that uh, after two weeks, we see a significant decrease of the FDG signal and, and already telling us very nicely that this patient is most likely benefiting from the therapy. And this becomes an also obvious when you look later uh, after 12 weeks. So uh, I think also PET-MR, uh, because low dose uh, in the future quite quickly, this might be one of the potential applications where we can uh, take advantage of both modalities uh, in oncology. So in summary, I, I, show, I hope I have shown you that indeed uh, the introduction of PET-MRI has been a technical revolution. Uh, we are now at the stage where we really can say we have the clinical translation successfully completed. We do use it. We do, uh, do quite a lot of different activities in daily routine only on PET-MR. Uh, I want to summarize again the ESN experience that indeed, yes, it's less patients for PET-CT, but we have a significant demand from clinicians and patients, a number of indications. I outlined uh, primary prostate cancer, neuroendocrine tumors, brain tumors, uh, but also uh, especially children and overall uh, more and more also in our lymphoma. And uh, I think there's still tremendous future potential as outlined with multiparametric imaging, artificial intelligence, new tracers, and, and, and potentially also with digital PET. Thank you very much.